Today we come to the second of two verses that are challenging, that can be taken many different ways. We have to realize that the context of Jesus speaking these words is he's in the upper room and he's trying to comfort his disciples. And last week we saw that Jesus was telling his disciples that the mission would continue, that Jesus Christ's work on earth would continue after he's gone. And today we see that he is telling his disciples that the relationship will continue even after he is gone. And many years ago, someone came up to me and said emphatically, prayer does not work. Now, what would you say to that? How do you answer when somebody says prayer does not work and you have many examples in the Bible of it working? And so I said, well, what do you mean? And this person said, I never get anything that I ask for. And I thought, ah, well, there's, maybe you're doing it wrong. I don't know, how do you answer that? And so we had a discussion about what prayer was, and perhaps they got the idea when we were done that prayer at its core is a conversation with God, and that always works. God is always listening and always ready to hear what we have to say. And if you're not getting all the stuff you're asking for, James says maybe you're doing it wrong. I read an article the other day which was very timely because we pray, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, but many Christians in their heart of hearts are praying, Our Grandfather who art in heaven, please spoil me. God has lots of stuff. The Bible says he has a cattle on a thousand hills, that he owns everything. Many of our prayers are just asking God to share that with us, that if he is all-powerful, move a little bit of power my way and fix my situation. If you want to make a million dollars with a bestseller, come up with a new way to pray. If you go to Barnes & Noble, which I think is the last standing bookstore, and you look for prayer, first of all, you'll find it in the self-help section, which I think is interesting, not the religious section. And you will find all sorts of books on how to pray. Many of them aren't even Christian because prayer has become a a spiritual activity that the Buddhists can do and the Hindus can do and the Muslims can do and everybody out there can do. But when the Bible speaks of prayer and when Jesus is speaking of prayer, what is he talking about? There is a theology of prayer in the Old Testament, and if you read through particularly Psalms, the the request is that God hear their prayer. That is because God in the Old Testament was seen as wise and benevolent and good and loving, but he didn't always hear your prayer, because if he heard your prayer in an Old Testament covenant, you were sure to benefit from it. And so you don't have people in the Old Testament saying, please answer yes, it's more, please hear my prayer. But the theology in the New Testament is, God always hears our prayer. If you are a believer, you have a relationship with God, and when you think, when you speak, God hears you as a loving Father. But still, sometimes people do not get all that they want. And once again, I think in James it says they're doing it wrong. And so we're going to look today at this passage in John, and we're going to finish with the passage in James. And I could take, I literally could take ten weeks to give you a full theology of prayer in the Bible and how it works in every book of the Old Testament and every book of the New Testament and how even though the book of Esther doesn't contain the name of God anywhere in it, they were still praying people and God was still in control. And even though Jonah was very disobedient, he was a man of prayer. But I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to look at these two little verses and give you a window into what Jesus is telling his disciples about prayer 
And then maybe later, I'll do a big old series on prayer. But he gives four things to his disciples, and we can use them today as for prayer. And the first and foremost, and, and one that is not commonly talked about, is that for prayer to work, you do have to be saved. If you want your prayers to be heard, the, the foundational move on your part is to become a believer in Jesus Christ and become part of the family of God. If you are unsaved and you are praying, there is no guarantee God will even hear your prayer. He can hear your prayer. He might hear your prayer. But in Scripture, the only guarantee of people that He is in communication with are the saved. Now somebody say, whoa, what about people who pray to be saved? Well, sure, God, as I said, can and does hear the prayer of the unsaved. But there's no guarantee in Scripture that when an unsaved person in a foxhole in a war zone prays for God to save him, that God's going to hear him and do anything about it. Because the guarantee of Scripture is you have to have a relationship with God. You have to be his child. That is the New Testament theology of prayer. And then every prayer you utter is heard. Every prayer you utter is acted on. Secondly, you have the Holy Spirit if you are pray, if you are saved. And the Holy Spirit is continually praying on your behalf. We are told in Scripture that we don't really know how to pray, or we don't know how we ought to pray. And so the Holy Spirit is praying on our behalf, interceding for us. The unsaved do not have that. They are going it alone. And secondly, Jesus Christ, when he ascended into heaven, we are told... He sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. That's where he is today. And what is he doing? He is praying for you. So you have the Holy Spirit who is in you and Jesus Christ, your Savior, praying for you to God the Father. And that is what you have when you are saved. Now, as I said, if you go to the bookstore, if you go to Amazon.com and you look on books on prayer, this is not a major point. They believe that there are spiritual forces, the writer of these prayer books, and that prayer will move these spiritual forces. That is not true. If you are just speaking to spiritual forces out there, you are playing a dangerous game. You need to speak to God the Father Almighty, whom you know and who loves you. Secondly, if somebody gets on TV and starts talking about pray this and pray that and they do not know who their audience is, then unsaved people may hear that. And if they don't make it very clear that the foundation of prayer is salvation, then it can be confusing. And I think that's why prayer is offered to everybody. And today there is a move to, to move us into meditation, and there are books that say prayer is meditation. Prayer is not meditation. They are different things. The purpose of meditation is to clear out your, your spiritual and thought garbage and to, to focus your mind so that you can pray. Many people say they will meditate before they pray so that their focus is truly on God and Christian meditation, uh, taking, for example, John 3.16, and in a room with no distractions, just focusing on God so loved, the word loved, and what it means and how deep that love is, and clearing out all the thoughts of the day so that you're focused on the love of God. And then you can move into praying to God because you are now in a better mindset. But prayer is not meditation because meditation is in many ways self-serving, if you will. It's calming of yourself while prayer is a conversation with God. Prayer is a two-party event where you are speaking with God. And if all goes well, God is speaking to you. But you have to be saved for all this to work. Uh, if you are coming to God uh, in your own power, 
Uh, it, is a, it, it may work, it may not, but as I said, there's no guarantee in Scripture of God hearing any prayer except of the saved in the New Testament theology. Uh, if you're unsaved, it's like the Old Testament situation. Your first prayer better be for God to hear you because you don't have a relationship with Him, and so you need to get His attention in some way. And so once you're saved and you're moving into your prayer time, the second thing is you must use no other name. The passage says, if you ask anything in my name, I'll give it to you. So I should be able to say, Lord, give me a Mercedes-Benz in Jesus' name. Amen. And I'll get a Mercedes-Benz. No, I won't. Because that's not what it means. It doesn't mean to just tag on in the name of Jesus or in Jesus' name at the end of your prayer. It means that you're coming in somebody's name. Uh, there's a story that has been told uh, time again in, in books of illustrations. And it's a man who wrote a letter to his pastor, and he said, I am in great perplexity, for I have been praying for a long time for something that I am confident is according to God's will, but I do not get it. I have been a member of the Presbyterian Church for 30 years. I have tried to be a consistent, to be a consistent one all the time. I have been superintendent in the Sunday school for 25 years and an elder in the church for 20 years. And yet God does not answer my prayer and I can't understand it. Can you explain it to me? The pastor looked at this and he said, clearly what's happening is the person is coming in their own name. They list their qualifications for God to answer their prayer. They're a church attender. They volunteer here, they volunteer there. They're a pretty good guy, and therefore God should answer their prayer. And that is not what this passage says. If we come to God with anything other than Jesus Christ as the way in, we will fail. If we come because we think we're a good person or because we've done stuff, uh, I have known people who before a big decision will increase their giving to the church because they believe that will prompt God to hear their prayer more and see things more favorable in their way. God sees you as nothing apart from Jesus Christ. We have no claim on the throne of God apart from Jesus Christ. And so it's good to work for the church, and it's good to volunteer for God, and it's good to be involved in the activities of the church and attend a church. And that is more about your spiritual growth. But when you come to God in prayer, you come only through the blood of Jesus Christ. And we need to come humbly, we need to come thoughtfully, knowing that God isn't going to say, I'm going to answer your prayer because you're a good person. That's not how it works. He answers our prayers because of Jesus Christ and only Jesus Christ. And so it isn't necessarily what we say, but it's how we live and how we come to our prayer. If we come to our prayer with a bit of pride then we're going to fail if we come to prayer with humility, knowing that we bring nothing to the table apart from Jesus Christ. That's what it means to come in the name of Jesus. Number three is that we're representing Jesus. Uh, back in the old days, 2,000 years ago and more, and these stories are in the Bible, uh, I was just reading the story of Joseph, uh, Joseph was imprisoned, and then he interpreted the Pharaoh's dream, and he was made second in command of all of Egypt. And this is the last part of Genesis, the story of Joseph. And one of the first things the Pharaoh did was he took off his signet ring, the Pharaoh ring, and put it on Joseph so that wherever Joseph went, people saw the Pharaoh. Joseph was the public representation of the Pharaoh in Egypt. 
so that only when it came to the Pharaoh's household, the Pharaoh's wife, the Pharaoh's throne, the very core of leadership in Egypt, would the Pharaoh speak. If it had to do with laws or saving up grain for the famine and all that, when Joseph spoke, the Pharaoh spoke. And if somebody was disrespectful to Joseph, they were disrespectful to the Pharaoh. And what Jesus has done is he has given you his signet ring so that when you come to God the Father in your prayer, you are coming representing Jesus Christ. Now one thing Joseph had to learn was he had to learn how Pharaoh did things. He had to learn Pharaoh's desires and Pharaoh's wants. He couldn't take Egypt down a Hittite path, you know. He couldn't hand over the reins of Egypt to some other country. And so in knowing how Pharaoh would act, after seven years of plenty, I am sure that if you had Pharaoh and Joseph together, they would talk the same, they would gesture the same, they would do the same things, because one was representing the other. And when you come in prayer, you are, in essence, saying, Jesus sent me. When you go to God to pray, and when you say, Jesus sent me, you better come with words that Jesus would probably want you to speak. And if you're asking for a new car or a new house, you better be very sure that it is Jesus' desire that you ask that because you are saying, Jesus sent me with this request. And you say, well, well, how can I know what Jesus wants? Well, we got this book, and it's called the Bible, and there's four little books in it called the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and that is the life of Jesus. And the whole rest of the New Testament is a sort of commentary on the life of Jesus and how you live it. And if you know your Bible, you can know exactly what Jesus said, and you can know how Jesus acted, and you can know what was important to Jesus. And once you know that, you can begin to come to God and, in essence, ask the same things that Jesus would ask. And you will be surprised how quickly your prayers are answered and how quickly things move forward because you are now on the same page of Jesus. You are now on the right road. You are now, as we might say, in God's will, in your prayer. And so, if you're doing it in Jesus' name, and you're truly representing Jesus, the goal would be that God is glorified. Jesus says he's going to answer your prayers so that God will be glorified. And if God is working through you and God is showing himself through your prayers and you can come to Bible study and you can come to church and say, I pray this, 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 and this, and God did this, 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 and this, that gives him glory, that lifts him up, that proves he is real to the unbelievers that may be here. And so... We can pray for anything, but if we slow down and think about what we're praying and think about representing Jesus, then it will be clear that what we're praying is for God to be glorified. When we think about Habakkuk's prayer, because the whole third chapter of Habakkuk is a prayer, and we looked at it in January, He was praying for God to be successful in his activities and for God to bring revival and for God to be merciful. And I've thought about praying those things and I have gotten into a habit of of Sunday morning praying for various pastors that I know with the express prayer of God to be successful in whatever he's doing in that church, that God will be successful in whatever he's doing in this church. Now, one of those pastors I pray for is in Florida, so I get up early, so I can pray for that. All the rest of them are in my time zone, but that one that moved out to Florida, 
And I pray that God will be successful, that whatever that pastor is doing, and they don't share me their sermon plans or church plans, I just know they have churches, that God is going to be successful, and I can communicate with them, and I, I see what they post on various social media, and that gives me a direction as to how to pray for this mission and how to pray for that kid and, and these various things that God will be successful, and and Jesus wants God the Father to be successful. And if you can think of places and ways where you want God to be successful so that he will gain fame in the land, which is what Habakkuk prayed for, then that's a prayer that I think you're going to see results. But as I said, you're asking for a new car or a new house and you don't get it, uh... It is possible to ask wrong. It is possible to come at this prayer thing all backwards. And if you pray with covetous, selfish desires, covetousness, do not covet. That's the Tenth Commandment in your Ten Commandments. Coveting is when I see you come to church in your new car, and I say, man, I'd really like that new car. And all I can think about Sunday morning is that new car you're driving, I'm coveting your car, and that's a sin to look at something you have and for me to want it. But yet, I can actually pray, if I am totally out of God's will in that way, for God to give me your car and things like that, and I'm not going to get it. James is clear that if I pray out of covetous, selfish desires, that if my passions of the flesh come up, and I start praying out of the passions of my flesh. I am going to miss it. I'm not going to get anything. I'm going to be so far out of God's will. And I think if, if somebody believes that prayer is not working because they never get anything they ask for, it's because they are praying out of selfish desires. They are praying to maybe make their life easier with no real thought of God in it at all. Just make my life easier. And I think a new house and more money and a new car is going to make my life easier without a thought of God getting the glory. And I think we can work back our prayers and say, I'm going to work, I'm going to pray for this, this, and this. And I can actually see, because I know the Bible, how God can be glorified in this. Uh, There's a couple ways that we can come at this. You can pray spontaneously. I do that here and there as I think of things. Uh, Or you can sit down with a list or a checklist. Uh, Prayer is a communication. And throughout the day, when uh, my wife and I are apart, I will come up with thoughts of things I want to discuss with her. I will write them down. And then when she comes home at night, I'll pull out my phone and I'll have a checklist of all the things I thought throughout the day. And so I don't forget. It doesn't make it formal. It's just because, you know, we're all getting older and we all forget things. You can write down what you want to talk with God about. And when you come to your formal time of prayer, you can use notes. It's okay. And I think that if you use notes and you work through what you're going to pray about is it biblical and does it glorify God and things like this, I think you will be much more successful in your prayers. And the more successful you are in your prayers, the more God will seem real to you and the more you'll want to come to church and the more you'll want to be around Christians because God is now real to you. You are now having conversations with him, and you are being blessed, and you're feeling peace because of this. And that's a great thing. So to conclude, pray always. Pray about everything. If it bothers you, pray about it. If it makes you happy, pray about it. If a random thought about a random person comes to you, pray about that person. Every once in a while, I will have a thought of somebody from high school or somebody from the military that I have, I mean, 40 years ago. I have no idea if they're still alive, but their face just goes bonk. I pray about that person. I pray for their salvation. I pray for their safety. 
and I pray for their growth in Christ if they are saved. What else can I do? There's no way to check with them. But God clearly, in my opinion, wants me to pray about this thought, this person, this place, this event, even though my belief is that God is prompting millions of people all over the earth to pray about this one person at that moment, and great things are going to happen in their life, even though I'll, you know, I'll know in heaven. I'll go up in heaven, and they'll go, hey, you know, you prayed about me that one time, and this is what happened. We don't know, but we've got to pray always, and we've got to pray about everything. If you, are gonna, if you can talk about it to a friend, you can talk about it to God. And pray about everything. There's nothing that is out of bounds with prayer. Uh, one reason that prayer is not meditation is that prayer sometimes can be a battle. Prayer can be a struggle to get through something. Uh, there's an old acronym from years ago, PUSH. Pray until something happens. Hey, That takes time. That takes work. That, it, that can be a struggle, and you can end up worn out after a prayer like that, where you're, you know, pounding on the throne of God, saying, do something, kind of like Habakkuk did, and, and that it can be work, but you pray about everything, so you're praying all the time and about everything, and at its core, prayer is just having a conversation with God, and so if you are not used to prayer, or if you're out of the prayer mode, uh, just sit down and have a conversation with God. Ask him how he's doing, tell him how you're doing. A normal conversation like you would have with anybody that you know. And keep the conversation going and uh, see what happens. Prayer is that communication with God the Father Almighty. And when you are talking with God the Father Almighty in the power and the name of Jesus Christ, you truly have no idea how he's going to bless you, how he's going to move in your life, because the ultimate goal of prayer, the ultimate goal of us living in the name of Jesus is to glorify God. And when God glorifies himself, his fame is reached throughout the land. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, I just thank you that there is an opportunity for us to, to come into the throne room boldly, to bring our requests, to bring our praise, to bring our worship, so that if we are truly seeking who Christ is, whatever we ask, Christ will do it, and he will do it to bring glory to God. Lord, we thank you for this, this privilege that prayer truly is something and not this random stuff that the world says it is. I ask that you would teach us how to pray, that you would make us a praying people, that by praying we may open the floodgates of heaven, that your name may be known throughout San Lorenzo and Alameda County. I ask all this through the blood of Christ. Amen.